Yes, so I'm Simon Jep um, from the European Bioinformatics Institute. I'm going to attempt to avoid a first here, which is falling asleep in my own talk, because I think it's about 3 a.m. right now in my body, and I'm feeling it. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I work in the samples, phenotypes, and ontologies team at EBI, and I want to give really just an overview, a kind of broad overview of what we're doing in our group. Um, and in particular how we are um, taking advantage or utilising semantic web technologies in particular ontologies and moving more into the linked data space recently um, in pretty much everything that we do now. So this slide gives the um, your kind of overview um, if you're not f too familiar with all the services and data spaces at the EBI. And you can see that we cover kind of full spectrum really, right down starting at the genome molecular level, um, right through to databases dealing with sort of whole systems um, and pathways. And on the left hand side we have literature ontologies and these are really two new groups that have formed recently with EBI that are intended to be sort of cross cutting across the institute. So literature services being one because this applies to all the groups and this new samples, phenotypes and ontologies team, which I'm part of, who really aim at delivering um, standards and semantics using ontologies across all these different resources at the EBI. And where classically databases like Ensemble have really been dealing with the kind of identity um, issue in bioinformatics of identifying sort of genes and proteins and how these can be used to integrate across resources. In the SPOT team, we kind of focus at a sort of different level where we're more interested in kind of integration of sample data and uh, disease data and having standards and ontology for integrating at this different level. So I'm not going to have time to go over all the um, activities that were involved in. I've put this slide up um, that really gives an overview of the databases, and ontologies, and the tools that come out of our group. And if there's anything up here um, that you are interested in, then um, we'll be happy to talk about any of these while we're here from the Biohackathon. Um, so in terms of the databases, um, one of our primary databases is the Biosamples database. Uh, we're involved in the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, so we have a database of mouse uh, knockout mutants and um, a lot of phenotype data which is all tightly annotated with ontologies. Um, we have a collaboration with the NHGRI and we are now providing the database support for the Genome Wide Association Studies Catalogue. Again, um, heavy ontology annotation component there. Um, and we recently took over the ontology lookup service which is kind of a old and creaking slightly uh, ontology service at the EBI but still a very popular one and um, one of our roles over the next year will be to actually redevelop um, this service. In terms of actual ontologies we build, so we have the experimental factor ontology which really deals with experimental variables. Um, we've now consumed the gene ontology development at the, that goes on at the EBI. Uh, this is both the development of the ontology and the annotation of the Uniprot database. Um, and a whole host of sort of other ontologies that are relevant for some of the databases we work with, like the cell line, and we have a collaboration with Orphanet, so dealing with um, ontologies on rare disease. Um, the systems microscopy community, we're developing a cellular phenotype ontology for this community. And also in uh, the space of uh, just dealing with data semantics in general, so we have uh, the software ontology and the EDAM ontology for dealing with bio bioinformatics identifiers and types. And in addition to sort of developing the ontologies, uh, we actually require a lot of tooling that sort of help us in both the construction of the ontology and then tools for our curators uh, who use these ontologies to annotate the data. So we have our annotation platform called Zuma, which I'll mention shortly. And also then how you actually deliver, you know, to developers support for building applications around ontologies. And uh, one project that we're recently involved in is BioSolar where we're working with some of the solar developers to understand how we can incorporate ontology search um, as part of the kind of solar core technology. Excuse me. 
Um, another development at the UBI is the start of the Centre for Target and Therapeutic Validation. And we're involved in building ontologies for translational research here. So this is a collaboration, industry collaboration at the EBI. And we are particularly working on areas of connecting rare and common disease ontologies. And finally, the EBI IDF platform. So this was something that's been running a pilot project for the last two years, um, where we're up into full production now. And this is really where we hope to try and push all the data that comes from these various databases and the work that we do is this kind of delivery mechanism for presenting the data and the annotated data with ontologies. So I hope I don't need um, to convince people too much here that ontologies are useful and add value to data. And here's the kind of range of areas where we are utilizing ontologies at the EBI. So primarily we use them for smarter searching, so doing query expansion, uh, kind of faceted search. And ontologies are obviously useful in data analysis. Um, so through that packages like the gene expression data, we can do enrichment and analysis, not only on sort of with the gene ontology, which is kind of classical enrichment and pros, but we can now start to do sort of disease enrichment uh, and trying to explore some of the ontology annotations with different types of analysis. Obviously for data integration, so this is um, really our RDF work, and data visualization, so this is a a diagram of the latest um, genome-wide association studies catalogue and the whole diagram is kind of driven from an RDF and ontologies back end so we're really making use of this technology now to drive and develop novel visualizations of data. So this kind of represents the challenge that we have in uh, the SPOT team is that we have in the biosamples database a whole range of sample attributes and this is really the area that we need to be focusing on in terms of the ontology annotation that we do. And you can see some of the big sort of common areas in here is sort of disease, uh, organism parts, the species, organism in general. Um, and this is really where we focus all our annotation effort. And then surprisingly, uh, we have this long tail of data. So on the left hand side, we have the kind of stuff that we see very commonly across all the data sources at the EBI. And there's this long tail of stuff that we see with decreasing frequency. And really what we're trying to do through curation and annotation is to make the left-hand side of this graph a little bit fatter. So trying to normalize as much as we can across all the sort of variable data that we see so that we can do better integration. And we do this through a kind of simple kind of semantic markup approach. So this would be a typical um, assay description from an experiment in the Ray Express. <laughs> And we look at the, sorry, we look at the um, sample attributes and we try and tag these and associate these with known public ontology terms. And we have a team of curators um, largely doing this manually. Uh, and we use the experimental factor ontology as the kind of bridging ontology that connects us out into all of these external um, resources for doing this annotation. So a little bit more about the experimental factor ontology. We sort of call this an application ontology as rather than a reference ontology and essentially it's the ontology for the EBI it's, it, it, it's the ontology that we need to describe the data that we have at the EBI and we obviously don't ignore all the other ontology efforts that are out there so we, um, EFO essentially allows us to build this view across all these external <coughs> ontologies um, for the data that we need to annotate and the applications that we need to build So, given that we've got this ontology and this kind of large annotation effort, um, we've been developing this Zuma platform to kind of, excuse me, allow us to share the curation task across the EBI. So, whenever we have some kind of free text where a curator makes a manual assertion that, okay, this, this text submitted by the users annotates to this ontology term, we want to capture that piece of curation because that's really valuable. So Zuma is a central um, RDF store built around this open annotation model where we collect all the annotations, the manual annotations that our curators use. And then we can reuse this in, in, um, for automated ontology annotation of new data as it comes in. So you can see this, this is kind of an example and this is with some cellular phenotype data. This is typically the data as we see it coming in from the user. And this is the predicted Zuma annotation. 
And what you'll notice is that you wouldn't get these kind of annotations through lexical matching alone. It's only through the knowledge held in Zuma that we know that certain uh, terms such as SM phenotype, for example, can actually map to this metaphrase arrested phenotype. So um, we are using Zuma now to collect and harness annotations from all the different resources across the EBI. Um, and we think that this makes for an actually powerful um, automated ontology annotation platform. So another area that uh, project really that we're working on at the moment. Um, so previously I was involved in a project called Rightfield, which was about how you get biologists to actually annotate data up front. So whereas Zoom is trying to annotate data that's already come in, how do we actually get users to annotate their data before they submit? Um, and the Rightfield application allowed us to embed ontology terms within Excel spreadsheets. And we're working now with the project with the NCBO um, the BioPortal team to extend this to work with Google Spreadsheets so we can start to actually collect data and embed ontology annotation directly into Google Spreadsheets. So this is a tool that's just currently being developed and it's quite nice. Um, another slightly different area and thing that we care about is actually how we deal with the evolution of data. So you can imagine as we scale things up we have this external dependency on all these ontologies that change. All the databases change and then the annotations that sit in the middle between the ontologies is also changing here. So we're now starting to think at how we actually manage the evolution of this data because changes in external ontologies um, have implications that filter right through to the applications of the EBI. So we, we need to know, you know when an ontology changed and then whether this actually has any impact on the, the databases that are using those ontologies. So the Diachron project is an EU project that's really about um, understanding um, how data changes, in particular RDF data, and we have a kind of prototype application up where we can run it through the experiment over all the monthly releases of the experimental factor ontology and see these changes. And obviously these big kind of spikes like this are important for our curators because they tell us that something kind of major has gone on here, a large set of deletions and a large set of additions. Uh, and we can actually track this back down to a sort of re-import of um, the Orphanet ontology, and this then has a whole sort of chain of consequences for the databases. So, this is something that we're interested in. And finally, I want to get onto the EBRDF platform. So, this is a slimmed down picture of the slide, the, the first slide that I showed, and these are all the resources now at the EBI that are currently generating RDF. And um, we've been working quite heavily to make sure that all of this RDF is um, interoperable across the EBI. So we, we had a, a group who got together uh, members from each of these resources to deliver the RDF platform. And um, you can see that we're fairly well represented across the EBI now that you can actually come and take a, um, all the RDF dumps for all these data and install them in a kind of local virtuoso. And you've got a pretty powerful warehouse of um, biological data. So some of the key features, uh, we, we weren't too ambitious initially with the RDF platform. What we wanted to provide was really to explore can you do public Sparkle endpoints at production quality. Um, so this means in line with existing database production cycles. And we really focused on some of the kind of key areas we think that are important, certainly for usability, which is making sure that we have ample example queries for each of the data sets readily available at the Sparkle endpoints. Uh, do a lot of work on doing the schema diagrams to help people understand the structure of the data in the RDF stores. And we also have been working on generating these data set descriptions as part of the sort of, well, in collaboration really with the healthcare and life science community. So we have these standard uh, metadata descriptions for each of these data sets. And we developed uh, this Lodestar link data browser um, that's having some use outside of the EBI now for really providing us with a consistent sort of look and feel for how you interact with the RDF data at the EBI. So I can briefly comment on some usage. Um, we get around 1,500 unique users per month. Um, and I was just looking then at the usage, and we see a kind of mixture between sort of some months we get around 10,000 queries, which is reasonable. Some months we have around 50 million queries, so this is clearly people are scripting against the endpoints. And one of the things that we are pleased to report is that we do have over 99% uptime. So the way that we have the system set up, 
we have various failovers in place, so we actually believe that you can host scalable public Spark endpoints despite um, some people disagreeing. And um, we see a lot of the, the uh, okay, thanks. Um, a lot of the usage of this comes through actually developing apps. So one app that was developed by James Malone is the Atlas RDFR package, um, which received has already received over 2,000 downloads, and we see a lot of hits coming to the RDF platform. So this app package is built entirely on the RDF platform. Um, and other tools such as various uh, Sparkle query builders that people have been building that we see a lot of usage of coming in through these. And one of the things that we're looking for and to sort of encourage while we're here is looking for people to innovate with this RDF platform because that's what's really needed for us to sort of push it to the next level at the UBI where essentially you could get every single data set available in RDF. So as Toshiaki mentioned earlier, we were here uh, for the RDF summit earlier in the year and the ma major outcome of this was this uh, <coughs> schema that we developed for the Ensemble Core database and I'm pleased to say that this is now available. Um, it's not quite in production yet, but it's available to use um, next week and to play with, and we encourage you to go and have a look at this data set. And I just want to quickly finish with what we hope to get out of the following week. So we have, we're very lucky to have Will McLaren here from the Ensemble Variation Team. So we'll be spending the first uh, few days developing a core schema for the variation data from Ensemble. And this will have some particular challenges um, to do with scale. So Will tells me there's 80 million variants for human alone, and we'll have to think about whether this is actually sensible to sort of materialize all this RDF up front, or should we be looking at some kind of on-the-fly or query rewriting techniques for dealing with this scale of data. Uh, we're also interested in general in modeling biological identifiers uh, and trying to get this consistent across all the data sets that are generating uh, life science RDF data and applications, so anyone interested in working with R to do analysis of data by pulling data from the RDF platform or visualizations with say BioJS or D3 and they will say a little bit about BioJS after this um, and tools for assisting users in writing Sparkle queries, so this is something that we often get asked for. Uh, a couple of other ideas that James and I talked about on the plane um, and we've kind of talked about with Michelle before about possibly how can we set up this kind of, we've called it a bio-sparkle bank, but some kind of public area where people can share useful and interesting queries that they've generated with Sparkle, because people really need good examples of how they can actually use this data. Um, and another thing that we did recently was um, a paper on 10 simple rules for working with ontologies, one of these POS papers, and it may be an idea that we could think about this within the bio-hackathon community of how we might actually come up between us with a consensus sort of um, set of rules that might help inform people interested in uh, RDF. So there's James, I've also met, already mentioned James, but here's his beautiful picture. <laughs> okay, so I'm finished now. Um, I have to acknowledge people. Um, I really have to acknowledge the uh, curators that sit back at the EBR because they, they're the ones that rarely get to come on these exotic trips and do actually all the hard work of curating the data for us. Um, and all the people involved in the EBRDF platform, and obviously our funders, and obviously the Bio Hackathon organisation team for inviting us to this event. I uh, feel very privileged to be here. So with that, thank you, and as I'm from Wales, I've brought a very special whisky from my home country, which I hope to enjoy with you later this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you.